on today's show, the Tesla Model S 2021, my impressions and stuff that you might not have seen, and a little bit more. G'day and welcome, my name is Chris and I cover it from an Australian perspective, everything happening in space around renewables like electric vehicles, solar, wind, battery storage and more. If you're new to the channel, thanks for coming along, consider subscribing, it's free. If you want to take your support to the next level, come and join us over here on Patreon, where from as little as $2.50 per month, you get early access to news, polls, behind the scenes and stuff that I just can't show you here. And a big thank you to my producers, Tesla Nagong, Nigel Farrier, MNICT Specialist, Ashley Hill, Alan Burnt, and Adam Tyson. If you're new to the channel, Monday is my mega news show, which means that some stuff you may have seen last week, but a lot of it you probably haven't because my Patreons did. I use chapter markers, so please jump to whatever story interests you and enjoy. Volvo Australia announced pricing for its XC40 recharge, the electric SUV ahead of its quarter three release in Australia. Available in one luxury specification at $76,990, for this price, buyers will get a compact SUV capable of doing 418 kilometers on one charge. It's powered by twin 150 kilowatt electric motors on the front and rear axles, which provides all wheel drive and power output of 300 kilowatts and 660 newton meters of torque, fed by a 78 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery, zero to 100 kilometers per hour in just 4.9 seconds, making the XC40 recharge one of Volvo's most powerful cars produced. Inside, the emphasis is on Scandinavian minimalistic design, using aluminium accents and contrast stitching in the luxury leather accented seats. Unlike other Volvo XC40 models, the XC40 Recharge has no start-stop button. Instead, once it's unlocked, you sit in it, buckle up and drive off. The Volvo XC40 Recharge is the first vehicle in Australia to come with a fully integrated Google Android infotainment operating system with Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store built in. In addition, you get wireless device mirroring like Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. This is where this car gets really competitive. First, it's packed with luxury trim, such as Harman Kardon premium sound system, a 20 inch graphite diamond cut alloy wheels, heated seats throughout the entire cabin, digital audio broadcasting, that's like DAB radio, inductive charging for smartphones, park assist front and rear camera with 360 degree camera view, adaptive cruise control, pilot assist lane keeping, heel descent control, auto dimming internal and external mirrors, LED headlights, two zone climate control, and of course, the usual swag of safety features, including city safety, collision warning, and mitigation. That $76,909 price places the recharge almost on par with the equivalent ICE version of it. I'm really impressed that whilst we still don't have the slightly larger Model Y in terms of range and pricing, this again is a very attractive proposition, especially when you consider its feature, range, and dollar value. We've all heard it before. The problem with solar power is that the sun doesn't always shine. Isn't that right, Bob? So I have news for you. Melbourne's RayGem Resources has successfully tested its locally developed technology that uses the, sun, the sun's rays to generate and store electricity, meaning that when the sun don't shine, even at night, solar can still be providing energy. The system works by focusing sunlight onto like a photovoltaic receiver mounted on a central tower to produce electricity. The process creates heat as a byproduct, which RayGen captures to heat water to 90 degrees and is then stored in an insulated pit. A second pit stores water chilled to near freezing with excess electricity from solar PV receivers. The temperature differential allows electricity to be generated using the organic ranking cycle, ORC. That's like one of these things. Think of it like a closed loop turbine whereby vapors are used to spin a turbine, which in turn makes electricity. This first of a kind solar hydropower plant is shifting to large scale trial and will be capable of producing four megawatts of power and 150 megawatt hours of energy storage. 
That's equivalent to 17 hours that would... That's equivalent to being able to run a small town for up to 17 hours. What I love about this project is that it's an Australian invention. Being a closed loop system, the two pits of water, approximately nine Olympic sized swimming pools, don't lose any of their precious stuff to the atmosphere. Importantly, it wins the it wins a trifecta on cost. It's actually cheap to run. It can be scaled to up to one gigawatt hour of energy storage. Think of it like five of these, and it can run for a long time. Raytheon says that their system is able to compete with more familiar technologies like large-scale batteries and pumped hydro, and is capable of providing dependable energy, that is, dispatchable energy, everyone's favourite term right now, 24-7. And cost-wise, less than $100 per megawatt hour. I can't wait to see the system up and running. Okay, Australia, let's help each other out by sharing the latest news around charging. Last week, I brought you news on a Shell EV charger opening near me in Tallis Lakes, where these chargers are going to be co-located. And in a sign of things to come, a Queensland service station located in Toowoomba, that's west of Brisbane for those playing along outside of Australia, they've got this. Yep, a fuel price sign with an electricity charge amount in kilowatts per hour. Not bad. 30 cents per kilowatt hour. For people with conventional internal combustion engine cars, they're probably scratching their heads going, uh, I wonder how much it costs to fill up an EV. I'll tell you, Johnny, for a Kona EV, that will be about $19.20 for about 400 kilometers of range, or better put, less than half the price of a, sm of a similar ICE car. No doubt, as fossil fuel companies transition to become energy providers, P.S. The price story on solar hydro thing, that was actually got a bit of backing by the Chevron Corporation. Hmm, these guys. I think we'll be seeing more EV chargers in our service stations and hopefully remove range anxiety for those who don't actually really realise yet that it's not such an issue after all. Next up, with thanks to energy utility ACT EU AGL, oh, I, I don't know how you say it, it it's this. If anyone wants to have a stab at it, feel free. Anywho, these guys and EV networks, though the uh, charging network I spoke to about before, well, people who live in Canberra, you'll be getting 20 additional public electric chargers, fast chargers that is, within the next year. Detailed in the Driven, Roddy Schmidt reports that the rollout will involve all major town centres within Canberra. If you want to check this out, please do, links are below. Super Soco is set to launch the CPX City Power, an all-electric scooter. Designed from the ground up to meet the needs of urban commuters, this full-size scooter is fitted with a 45 amp hour battery, which actually confuses me. If I translate that to kilowatt hours, that's only like 2.7 kilowatt hours. Not very much juice if you ask me. Considering that this scooter is a bit over 100 kilograms and then you put like a full grown adult on it like me, I'm just not very sure how far this thing can really take you. They do say it will do 140 kilometers if you pack two batteries into it. So I guess time will tell. The four kilowatt motor produces a respectable 171 newton meters of torque with Super Soco claiming performance akin to a 125cc scooter. A cool feature that once again demonstrates how awesome electric vehicles can be, the CPX has a reverse function to help you manoeuvre easily into parking spots. Anyone who's ever tried to push a bike into or out of a spot will know that being on an incline it can be very difficult and a real workout on your legs. Other features include LED lights, 16 and 14 inch wheels, disc brakes, keyless ignition, inbuilt alarm, windscreen and luggage rack. Price from $7,609 right away, available for delivery in late June 2021. I reckon this scooter is well priced, well equipped, and actually a great alternative to petrol scooters. All right, patrons, time for a round of bites. And first up, it's concept car time, aka will it ever get to market? And I think this story is just for you. Why? Well, I don't believe it will actually get to market. I run the full promotional advert here now on Patreon, so take a look. Okay, 
Okay, what do you think? Cute? A bit. Do I like the look of it? Nope, not one bit. It reminds me of Aptera's 2E. That's uh, like a concept build thing that they did in America in the mid 2000s, which never made it to market. I did like the camping ability of it, but if you rewind the video to where shopping was placed into the tiny boot space, and then compare, or consider rather, how that might then translate if you, a human being, were camping inside of that thing, I think you gotta be one, smacked up against that glass, and two, have a serious cramp issue in your legs overnight. In the Aptera press release, they claim the Soul could do 1600 kilometers on one charge. That's mighty impressive and no doubt due to its aerodynamic styling, lightweight, and very efficient electric motors, which Aptera claims 100 watt hours per mile. That's three times more efficient than industry leader Tesla Model 3. Reportedly, more than 7,000 people have plonked down some cash for the Soul, which is now nearing alpha build phase. That's like nearly ready for release. But will we ever see it down under? Heck, even on American uh, roads? Maybe. Good news, my New South Wales friends. Transport Minister Andrew Constance says he will not follow Victoria's lead on introducing an electric vehicle tax, stating at this stage it's necessary to incentivise, not penalise EV uptake, and that for New South Wales it'll be many, many years before they even consider doing it. This is great and I applaud it and we should definitely get this message out there because, well, we still have South Australia looking to introduce this tax in their state in 2022. So South Australian friends, make sure you're getting in the ear of your local politician. Last week, Tesla Australia introduced Tesla insurance through a third party provider. Unlike in the US where there's actually an offering from Tesla underwritten by another insurance company, obviously. This is basically a preferred insur insurance provider. Uh, so I'm kind of disappointed in this, in that, well, the quotes I'm seeing people get online are either at the same or actually higher, not as good. Uh, they won't match your loan dollar amount or cover full self-driving. Uh, what else? They it, it doesn't take into account your driver profile and how you behave on the road which is what the American version is doing. Um, I haven't covered that obviously on this channel because well, it's, yeah, it's, it's insurance. I, I'm not gonna get into that, but just here's one sentence summary. In the US, uh, if you go down the Tesla insurance route, they're collecting, and you have to agree to it obviously, about well, a dozen or so different parameters around how fast you accelerate, decelerate, emergency breakers use, number of autopilot uh, disconnects, things like that. And that affects how much your insurance premium is going to be. Uh, so this in Australia is not anywhere near that tech savvy. And uh, yeah, I think that's probably all I need to say on the matter. Last week, Tesla unveiled its Model S Plaid. And oh my gosh, this thing is going to be amazing. Zero to 100 kilometers per hour in 2.1 seconds estimated. Um, a sub 10 second uh, quarter mile drag time a launch mode and well a lot more so instead of giving you a summary of probably everything you've already seen so far i'm going to try to cover off stuff that doesn't wasn't either covered or was perhaps not spoken about enough so let's dive in the 2021 model s tri-motor is well groundbreaking on many levels it is actually the first production car and i caveat that that means to say they've actually put out more than 25 to customers see this video up here uh, as to what used to be potentially the world's fastest car but well that's a bespoke million dollar car that it actually has not sold 25 units so until that happens right now tesla has got the crown on this hmm. nonetheless zero to 60 miles per hour in under two seconds that's crazy that kilometers per hour here folks but insane ludicrous that's plaid um watching the live teleconference um the live event rather it elon was having fun he he looked so excited he seemed more relaxed somewhat uh but curiously he was kind of looking at the uh the slides as though he's singing for the first time <laughs> uh I, I i like elon he's a funny character and uh he doesn't have those presentation skills of say tim cook or steve jobs but Nonetheless, he's a visionary. He's got 
engineering just coming out of his brain and some of his statements um like this little beauty uh, it just gets to my heart i love it i love it a lot uh my impressions so far is that the exterior is relatively unchanged and that's not a bad thing the interior i like a lot i still think they've missed a mark with regards to having the one little screen at the back um, they should have had in the back rear headrest for each passenger each passenger uh, we're talking about a premium car here and all other car makers when you think about the bmw 7 series mercedes s class those guys they all have that for the rear passengers um elon said can be controlled independently of the front screen and that the processing power of that um you know entertainment unit is at playstation 5 levels and they even demonstrated cyberpunk uh on their live stream so no doubt there's going to be uh, maybe i hope in the tesla arcade um model s and model x games that are unexclusive for that market because well the premium price they're asking here you really want to differentiate the two don't you that's just a really minor quibble isn't it i think for most people who um getting going to be getting a tesla model s they're going to be the primary driver so they're going to sit in the back very seldomly but staying with the back seat for a moment, that is going to be the place to be. It's extremely spacious because they've been able to move the dashboard, the panels out to the sides. They've increased the rear legroom quite substantially. And if you've ever been in a Model S, it actually is already a large vehicle. So this is going to feel luxurious, limo-like. Um, yeah, I think it's going to hit a lot of marks. Somehow in the rear, they've hidden the vents so that it's more a diffuse sort of system like we've seen in the Model 3 up to date. And you can see that in the front, obviously, where they're doing the same technology. Elon didn't talk to the active noise cancelling, which I've detailed in the show previously. And in the owner's manual, you can actually see this, where the microphones are actually situated in the front seats just by the shoulder zone, meaning that the person's ears are actually probably the focal point for the testing and the, the reverse uh, sine wave, I think they do, um, to actually get the uh, sound cancelled out within the cabin. Not that I think it's going to be needing that much treatment, to be honest, because there's already acoustic glass in this thing and it's electric, so it's super quiet as is. The user interface overhaul is great, I think very welcome. I like how you can move audio controls around to suit either the passenger or driver. The auto drive system, though not demonstrated, was talked about. And again, uh, I would like to see this in action, but at the moment it's under the beta phase, whereby if you're in park, you get in the car, you put the foot in the brake, and the car is going to guesstimate from a park position uh, if you're going to be going forwards or backwards. And uh, um, I've already seen some videos of this in action, and it works great. Uh, no doubt this is Tesla. This is Tesla, and I do like that they've actually increased the width of that strip as to, hey, if you may manually need to do it, you're going to do it through that center screen, that lovely 17-inch screen, and just swipe your finger upwards or pull it downwards to actually engage forward or reverse. What I'm still not convinced about is that yoke steering wheel. Whilst no doubt a, a very brave change, think uh, Apple with its removal of, um, like, uh, you know, USB card readers, um, what else have they done? Uh, removal of the headphone jack. Um, yeah, okay, removing the stalks, not needed on the left of the steering wheel. You've clearly got your indicator buttons. Uh, you've got your horn, you've got your wipers, you've got your lights. Everything's there that you need that was traditionally held and managed by yokes. But again watching someone actually turn around a corner in this thing as soon as you go past that 90 degree turn it just looks plain awkward if not dangerous and i appreciate people will actually train themselves to get around this but long term i'd be curious to see how actual owners feel about this change uh, it was my money and it was plonking down this much money Yes, my American friends, this is what you'll pay for in Australia compared to your price. I would not be comfortable making that step. Perhaps you could do it and you could go back to Tesla and say, I really just like this steering wheel. Can you just give me a normal, a traditional one, please? Um, the, uh, yeah, who knows? But in the forums so far, people are saying that the 
um, variability rate it has, is unchanged, which is what I was hoping for. And I, that, I thought it would be the savior in that when you go at slow speeds and you're parking it, doing a 90 degree lock to lock or like a 180 degree plane would actually mean the car does a full you know, steering wheel thing. But no, not yet. But this is software, this is Tesla. They could do it, I'm, I'm very hopeful. To quote Elon Musk, I think the summary of the tech behind this is that the engineering in this car is practically alien. It is groundbreaking, the fastest car in production in the world. They they gave out, well gave out, they headed to owners, 25 of them yesterday, so that ticked the box with regards to, um, you know, production car, um, you know, in production, so it is the world's fastest. Uh, that acceleration is kind of like what you get on a, a roller coaster. And, oh, I can't wait to experience it myself. But unfortunately, in Australia, that's going to mean at least 2022, end of 2022. So November, December next year, uh, which I've discussed previously. So I'm not going to get into that today. No doubt in the next few weeks, we'll see owners' videos go up online and we'll get to a bit more knowledge around about how the York steering wheel behaves, uh, review videos on the actual driving experience, that acceleration, how the user interface um, is actually better and different to like the Model 3, Model Y. And uh, I, I, I can't wait to see this car out in Australia. I think I've said that twice, three times already, but you get the idea. I just want to hear now. And <laughs> not that I could afford it, but Gosh, I would really like to, wouldn't I? But I think that's enough for today's show. If you have enjoyed it, please do consider giving me a subscribe. Think about leaving a comment. I do read them. Uh, share it on your socials. If you want to support the channel at the next level and want to get content like this, but early, polls, behind the scenes, stuff that I just can't show you here on YouTube, join me over here on Patreon where you get all this and more. Otherwise, you'd be good, you'd be great. One step forward, two steps backwards, yeah Immature lover who don't use big words, yeah